are Vineyard. Somos Viña. We are Vineyard. That was like a, a turning point because if you see someone who is blind right in front of you, has been for a long time, and they just start seeing, that has an effect on you. Yeah. And uh, a few months later, I went to Brazil with Randy and we we're in a stadium and praying for people for healing. And there's a couple blind kids uh, in the in the healing line. Friend and I prayed for them. They each got their eyesight back within a few minutes. And you, you could see because their eyes were white. <laughs> and, you know, so it wasn't just like, oh, you know, what do you need prayer for? You just look at them. You're like, well, your, your eyes are white. You're obviously blind. Yeah. So and they're like, yep, they're blind. You know, can't see a hand in front of the face. So we pray and, and both of them get their eyesight back. And wow. so I'm in this weird position where I'm, I'm going to work and I'm doing all this scientific research and I'm doing brain imaging experiments. And my research by that point is was getting pretty good traction. I mean, I was in the news all over the world for some of the, re the brain research I was doing. And yet ironically, here I am and I still have this brain tumor and I'm watching miracles happen. And it's like, this, I, I don't, I'm like, this can't be typical. Welcome to the We Are Vineyard podcast, conversations to help us grow with Jesus and each other. In today's episode, our host, Jay Pathak, talks with return guests, Josh and Candy Brown. Josh is a professor of psychological and brain sciences, and Candy is a professor of religious studies at Indiana University. Together, they conduct medical and scientific studies on the effects of in-person Christian prayer on health outcomes. And today, they're going to share more of their personal story of healing. Let's listen in. Josh and Candy, here we are again. We we get to do this again, which I'm super excited. I did end the last time saying I would love to come back and talk to you. And here we are. You said yes. So so that's good. Yeah, news. well, thank you. Thanks for having yeah. us back. Of course. Yeah, thanks for having us. Well, I think I sent I'm trying to think, because I don't exaggerate. I definitely sent our interview to at least twelve of my friends. Hmm. Because I said, listen, there's some serious people doing this work. This isn't just, you know, when we talk about healing and all the things that God is doing by way of his spirit, we're not just talking about people wearing shiny white suits with slick back hair and uh, you know, like slapping people. There are serious people that do this work, and so I am so grateful for the work that you're doing. It is serious work, pretty intense work, because we were talking a little bit before we were recording, so I'd, I'd love to land there. But but you're kind of in a different spot now where your, your story is sort of out and about, and uh, some of what your background is, which the last time we talked – you were thinking, ah, maybe we should be a little careful about how we tell our story, but things have changed a bit, and I, I can't wait to hear from you directly. Kind of what has brought you into this work and some of your some of your own story. So, and and it's New York Times ran a, a bit, right? Wow. Yeah, we thought long and hard about you know because the thing is if you if you start. I don't know, to becoming a public figure, then your your life can get harder. And I think in a lot of ways, we're happy to just sort of, you know, live our lives. You know, we've, we've got academic jobs. We're both tenured professors. Mm -hmm. And I, I like doing my research, running my neuroimaging lab and teaching grad students and you know, in many ways, life is, is good. And if you become a public figure, then, you know, if you're public enough, somebody's going to be unhappy with you. And so we thought long and hard, should we really go public? And, and I think at a certain point, you know, it's it's hard to hide something that's such a big part of your life. Yeah. And I mean, nowadays, there's a lot of talk about, you know, what does it mean to live authentically? And I mm. think... For so many years, we we very intentionally stayed under the radar, yeah. and and I and not not without good reason, because mm. since we have gone public, and I think that you know that kicked off on Christmas Eve last last Christmas Eve with the New York Times article about us, 
I think, you know, life has gotten a little more complicated <laughs> and, and, and I think in a, in a good way, but not without right. cost. Yeah. Well, and what, what would you add to that? Candy, is there anything you'd add to that? I mean, as you've processed getting out in public in this different kind of way, how, how have you well, this is this? something that we've, I mean, we've talked and prayed about this for, uh, I mean, literally decades uh, mm-hmm. now, because, I mean, we we definitely want to proclaim the good news of, mm-hmm. of the kingdom. And we don't want to be shy about that, but we also want to be strategic. Yeah. And I mean, actually, it was talking to Caleb Maskell, uh, among yeah. a couple of other people who he he really pushed us to tell our story. And uh, we have no regrets mm-hmm. about having done that. And so if anyone listening is wondering what Josh was just referring to, there's a, an op-ed piece that was written by Molly Worth then that mm-hmm. was published on Christmas Eve that you should be able to find. Yeah. So we basically told this reporter, Molly, our, our story, and we're happy to tell you that story uh, as well. I'm excited to talk about it. And just in case people haven't heard, we're going to link in our last time talking so they'll get a bit of your story. And hopefully we can even link in maybe that op-ed piece so they can look at but. Just, just to catch them up a little bit, talk about what you guys both do. You're both serious people. So tell us, tell us sort of <laughs> what you do. Serious. You are. I mean, you just really are. So tell us a little bit about what you do day to day, the kind of work you do, and then we can work backward toward the bits of yeah, your Yeah. Well, I mean, since, since I was just talking, I'll just say a little bit and then let yeah. Josh say That'd more. So we're both professors at Indiana University. My department is religious studies. And so I teach courses about Christianity, Mm -hmm. about both in the United States and globally, and about healing practices, both within Christianity and in uh, Buddhism and Hinduism. And sometimes as those are presented as secular practices, so things like mindfulness and yoga, in order to get into mainstream settings. And so I also get to publish books and articles, and one of the big themes over the last 20 years, and you'll understand a little bit more why this has been a theme, has been the growth of Christianity around the world as people have experiences of being healed by God miraculously, Mm -hmm. and even demons being cast out as a part of that healing process. That's become Mm -hmm. front and center in, in what I do in my publications. It's great. And Josh, and Josh, you already mentioned, you said, I have a neuroimaging lab. So you, you gave yeah. it away a little bit, but talk, talk I, about what you do day to day. I did. So I have a PhD in cognitive and neural systems, which my training was mostly in building computational neural models of brain circuits. So I build computer models. It's kind of a mix of the artificial intelligence, so, you know, like GPT-4 and that sort of thing. And, but we focus more on really trying to understand how specific parts of the brain do what they do, not just how we can build an artificial intelligence, but really understand the brain on its own terms. So I do a lot of building computer simulations of different parts of the brain. And I look especially at higher cognitive functions. So the question of how do people organize their behavior around specific goals? We do a lot of functional brain imaging, so we design experiments to try to better understand what's going on in the brain and and how to how to understand the mechanisms of the neural circuitry. We also do a lot of research in clinical populations, so some research with schizophrenia, a fair amount of research on addiction. Hmm. I'm now doing more electrical neurostimulation where we ask, can we electrically stimulate parts of the brain and potentially treat addiction that way? So it, it, it's really a mix of, of a lot of different things. I'm also currently the director of the neuroscience PhD program at the university here. So we've got about 50 grad students. Um, and and I should be clear here that I'm speaking in a personal capacity and not on behalf of my employer, Indiana University. Exactly. Yeah, that's good. That's probably wise. And so, so you, of course, have your own healing story. So that's really where we're dropping today, I assume. <laughs> and and you have, of course, this incredible academic background. We got to hear a bit about in the last podcast how you guys met and some of the work you do and even some of the studies that you have worked to publish. But of course, that all derives from some of your own story 
So tell us a little bit about what what would be sort of the origin points, because I don't have all the years lined up in my mind. When, when, what are some of the origin points where you started to realize um, or started to move towards experiencing healing? Well, so I, uh, for a little bit of background, I yeah. was, uh, I was uh, an undergraduate at, at UC San Diego. And, and while I was there in the mid nineties, I had grown up in a Baptist church. And so all the charismatic, you know, healing, that was all weird. And the people <laughs> yep, that were into that enough. were weird. And, and, you know, it just wasn't part of the experience. And while I was an undergraduate, at one point, we had a very powerful meeting and people were, you know, standing up and talking about some heavy stuff. And in the middle of that, this woman suddenly fell over and started rolling around on the ground and screaming and cursing Jesus. And her voice mm. changed to this guttural and uh, the the staff who were running the meeting were like, "Oh, look at the time! I think we better uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, we wrap should, this up. We here. should do something else. <laughs> yeah, let's get out of here." <laughs> and so, right. so this, but this woman was just you know shaking on the floor. She wasn't unconscious, but she she was just screaming, cursing Jesus. And so the staff worker was like, "Well, you know, if there's a demon in there, you know, knock it off." And <laughs> and so and then she cursed Jesus all the more. And wow. So anyway, each of us grabbed a limb and carried her out to a car and took her to her apartment and prayed with her while she continued to scream and curse Jesus and wow. and shake and her eyes were kind of rolling back in her head and all sorts of. So I kind of filed that away under, hmm, I, I don't know I, if there was something demonic, it might look like that. But yeah, you know, I would say. And <laughs> yeah. then when the yeah. when the Toronto revival happened in in late '94, I was an international student in uh, in Scotland, mm. and the, the Toronto people went over to Edinburgh where I was, and I walked in kind of what's all this revival meeting stuff all about, and I watched people rolling around on the floor and. And, uh, you know, and I, people prayed for me, but I felt nothing, you know, I thought, right. well, they're just, you know, they beat their little excitable and I'm not the excitable type. And so, but a few nights later I was in my dorm room all by myself and all of a sudden out of nowhere, it was like the presence of God showed up in my room and I, wow. and I didn't know what to, you know, I, I had no language to describe it. I just knew this incredible love of God just in, flooded me and, mm. And, uh, you know, years later, I was talking to people, they said, oh, you got filled with the Holy Spirit. And I said, right. oh, is that what you call it? You mean other people have had that experience too? Oh, wow. Who knew? Right. And so I, you know, it was sort of quite by accident or unintentionally. And right. so then that that was all sort of preface to, to where things really got going in 2003. So Candy, do you want to add to that before we... Yeah, yeah. yeah. How did parts. how did you experience yeah. any of that well, stuff? Well, I mean, so I I grew up in a Mennonite Brethren church, which is like the pacifist Baptists, and yeah. so uh, I too had an experience with Toronto, where some friends of mine and I went up there, and we spent a full week mm. in January of ninety five when things were still kind of pretty intense over there, and yeah. got a lot of inner healing, uh, mm. I would say. And again, I also just kind of filed it away uh, for later. And then the context of when Josh and I met was we were we were part of a church planting team for a vineyard church uh, mm. in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, right. The church actually met in my living room, like about a foot outside of my bedroom door <laughs> uh, for for some time. And so we were a part of that for what, like four years. Yeah, four uh, years. Yeah. Uh, and pretty, very, very involved uh, mm. in that. But we didn't really talk about healing in, in the church. Um, mm. it, it just kind of so happened that like the story that Josh told of the person in the college Christian group, all the people who seemed to have some very kind of extreme things going on with them, they would either find their way to the home group that we led, or the pastors of the church would send them our way thinking that we knew what to do with them, which we That's actually funny. 
didn't. No, we didn't. There would be like someone's <laughs> voice would change uh, every time we would pray. It would get really wow. deep. She'd start threatening to kill the pastor's children and us. And wow. we, we didn't really know what to do uh, with, with any of this. But we are very, uh, we spent a lot of time like ministering to people who are in some pretty intense settings. So all of that is then kind of backdrop. And we both finished our PhDs. He was at Boston University. I was at Harvard. We both finished up in 2000. Hmm. And then we headed off to our first jobs and then spent a year uh, at Vanderbilt. And then spent, we we then moved on to St. Louis, where he was at Washington University in St. Louis, and I was at St. Louis University. And then we decided, uh, you know, I think it's maybe it's time we can start having a family. And we started Hmm. kind of making preparations for that. And our story really picks up when I was nine months pregnant and Mm. very, very pregnant, uh, actually four days uh, before the birth of our first daughter. And this was in August of 2003 now. Mm. So you have these markers. Both of you have some things that have happened, but you've mostly filed those away as just kind of odd. I don't know. I guess that happens here and there. Yeah. Well, and I I do actually remember very specifically visiting a vineyard church and uh, I, this might have been in St. Louis. I don't remember which mm. one even, but I remember that there was someone who uh, was went up to the front of the church who uh, had like stage four cancer and the mm. whole church was praying for this person. And I had never really seen anything like that before. Yeah. And I remember at that point filing it away. If ever in need of healing, find Vineyard Church. <laughs> now that <laughs> is a great quote like may that be you know uh, if you ever need healing when in doubt go find those vineyard people you know they'll pray for you at least they'll 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 try okay so all that's in the background so it's sort of like just floating back there now you're 9 months pregnant and it sounds like some there's a turn so so what what happens so 4 days before candy gave birth to our first child uh, i went to bed one night and when i woke up the next morning i found that i was not in my own bed i was in the back of an ambulance wow and that's disorienting because i i woke up and i had an oxygen mask on and tubes everywhere and i thought wait what uh, how did i get Last I knew, I went to bed, so yeah. I'm in an ambulance, and the paramedics said, well, you've had a seizure. So they hauled wow. me to the ER and, you know, did a CT and make sure I didn't have brain bleed or something. And so then they said, well, you're not going to die right away, but you need to see a neurologist, and uh, and you can't drive a car. So meanwhile, a few days later, Candy went into labor. We had to bum a ride from someone to get to the hospital. And wow. so Candy was recovering from a C-section and I was at the same time on the other end of the hospital getting MRIs done on my head. And when our daughter was like two and a half weeks old, the MRI results came back and they said, well, we're sorry, but you have a brain tumor. And, oh. and I immediately freaked out because I'm a neuroscientist, right? It's my job to <laughs> understand yeah. the brain. And so... You know, I read the I can read the medical literature just the same. And and I realized immediately this was bad and mm. people don't live more than a few years with what I had. Mm. And, and I wasn't opposed to medical treatment, but it just wouldn't have done any good. Basically, mm. it doesn't it didn't at times statistically prolong lifespan. So I was looking at a few years and then, you know, re- and then nothing You know, not chemo, not radiation, not surgery, nothing would significantly prolong my life, uh, you know, based on what I saw in the literature. And so in an instant, I went from, you know, I have a good career now as a neuroscientist and I've got a new, you know, brand new baby. And all of a sudden it looks like I'll be dead in a few years. And so that was pretty horrible. And uh, so then, <laughs> so then what do we do? Yeah, and... exactly. What do you do? I mean, well, so the night of the medical diagnosis, so Josh comes home and 
I, I would have thought that I would have freaked out to, to be given this news because like if my computer battery dies, I freak out, uh, right? <laughs> it doesn't take a whole lot to set me off. Uh, but I was, I was surprisingly calm mm. and I just, uh, I, I sensed that the Holy Spirit was, was with me and, uh, wow. would be with us, uh, in this, uh, kind of whatever was going to come next. And so as backdrop to this, like, so a few months before, before the seizure, I had had, um, I was just kind of, I don't even think I was praying necessarily, but I just sensed that the Lord was speaking to me. And this was not my experience. Like I didn't really have a whole lot of like prophetic background. I mean, this, I had a little, I mean, I've been around vineyards and so forth, but I just sensed the Lord was saying that some things are going to happen and you can't change or stop them, mm-hmm. uh, but you can choose whether you greet them with fear or with faith and your lives depend on the choice that you make. Wow. And I told Josh about this. We're like, well, we're going to have a baby. Like that seems like a little bit more than we need to, to prepare for that. So we didn't really know what to do with it. We just kind of filed it away. But in the same kind of time period, I also remember having a dream. And in this dream, I kind of heard a voice, saw a face, both of which were bad. And, uh, it, and the, the language of it was, my name is such and such. And it was a very specific, unusual, proper name. Mm. And basically, Basically, I'm going to kill you or I'm going to destroy you or something along wow. those lines. And that was completely out of the realm of yeah. anything that I'd ever encountered before. And I didn't even tell Josh about that one because that was just like, must have just been a very odd dream. But it kind of stayed with me. And like, I remember mm. kind of praying about it a couple of times um, in, in the intervening weeks. And then on the night of the medical diagnosis, uh, Josh went to bed. Uh, I was up in the middle of the night nursing our newborn. And as I was doing that, I sensed that once again, the Lord was speaking to me mm. and saying, you remember the name from your dream. You need to know that. Wow. And so at that point, I Googled the name and it turned out it was the name of a code book for a particular kind of religious group that mm. seemed kind of off to us. And what was really unusual about it was we had just been interacting with a representative of that group, which was an unusual thing, in a park right across the street from our house. And Josh had specifically been talking to this representative for the group about some expansion that they were doing. And mm. then we went went back to this intercessory prayer group with the church that we were attending, and we started praying about this uh, mm. in, in this group, not really kind of thinking about uh, what we were taking on or what we were doing in, in, in that. So this kind of like, well, very odd kind of. So I let Josh sleep. Next morning, though, I went in when he was starting to, to wake up back into our bedroom. And I kind of said, well, here's this dream I haven't told you about and mm. kind of all of this stuff. Does this mean anything to you? And as soon as I said this, uh, Josh said, well, no, it doesn't mean anything to me, but I feel really agitated. Like I just drank like seven cups of coffee and we need to pray. Hmm. So I start praying and I say, well, if there's a spirit named such and such, then leave us alone in Jesus name. So soon as I did that, uh, Josh launches out of bed, starts turning somersaults all over our bedroom floor. He's awake. He's fully conscious. He actually wow. tells me not to call 911 because, <laughs> well, the reason he got to the ambulance the last time, it was because I called 911 right. because his arm like shot up in the air. His eyes were like fixed and dilated. He wasn't awake. He wasn't asleep. He yeah. starts foaming at the mouth. Like that's what happened during the seizure. Yeah. This was not a seizure. He was, he was fully awake, but Uh, Every time I would say tumor, seizure, or this name from my dream, his head would like whip around and he would like snarl at me, no. And then I said, well, why don't you try worshiping Jesus? And so he says, well, I belonged to and he couldn't say the name of Jesus. Wow. And so at that point, uh, I'm thinking, you know, that was a really odd thing that happened during the seizure. I'm starting to think about herds of pigs and the gospels <laughs> right. and thinking we don't have any of those. Right. Well, we have a house cat. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. What's my He's model here? Crazy right. enough. We don't yeah. need a demonized house cat. Yeah. So there are squirrels outside the window. I can tell them to go into the squirrels. <laughs> I mean, that was as much as I as I had picked up. I love it uh, from from all of this. Um, had no idea what I was doing. Right. So this went on for about forty five minutes. At the end of which, Josh was exhausted and hoarse, mm. and it was clear that nothing had gone anywhere. That uh, whatever it was was just like done for the moment. So right. we called the pastors of our um not charismatic church uh, i love this so at, much <laughs> at, at, at that point and five of them came on over we first tried calling the missions pastor thinking well maybe he'd have some framework while he was off doing missions oh. so these five other guys come on over uh within the hour uh, we tell them the whole story. He starts mm. flopping around on the floor. They tell us our floor looks a little bit dirty uh, and start singing songs about the blood of Jesus. A uh, note to everyone that just makes things worse. Didn't right. help at all. Right. This goes on for about an hour. And well, it's time time for them to go. Except the one person who wasn't there was the senior pastor of the church who came over a week later. And by this point, we were starting to kind of look into kind of like some healing things and yeah. all that Josh tell you about that part. And he's like, well, I, I know you've got your hopes up here, but I want to I want to make sure that you don't lose your faith when mm. Josh is not healed. You need to prepare to die well. Wow. And he proceeded to tell us a testimony of someone who'd had a brain tumor, lived longer than anyone expected, and who was currently dying right then. And so mm. we needed to follow that example of uh, keeping our faith while Josh died. Wow. That was not helpful in any yeah. way. So we forgave, we blessed, and then we we needed to find another church of, of people who would kind of walk with us in the jury the in the journey that we now commenced. Yeah. So Josh. <laughs> well, and, th and this is all stuff that's like, you know, I'm sure any number of people listening are like, what? But here's the thing: like, this is not a completely random story. I mean, there are lots of people that have experiences like this, like yeah. lots and lots and lots. I was talking with someone earlier today who they, I was just talking this through and they, they've been having a few kind of demonic encounters and they felt really weird or guilty almost like, gosh, does this make me bizarre or strange? I'm like, well, listen, this is strange, but it's more common than I think many of us talk about. And when we don't have a paradigm for it, even though the, the scriptures do give us a paradigm for it, you can feel like maybe I'm just going crazy here, you know. And given the rest of the other intensity, I'm thinking, man, you have a new kid. You've got like serious jobs. You have a brain. I mean, there is a lot going on here. That's a lot at once. I and mean, I remember... During the, you know, when, when this all happened and Candy's like, well, leave him alone in Jesus name. And I'm shaking and screaming at her and then trying to stop myself from screaming at her, but not entirely successfully. And I was fully conscious. And I remember mm. thinking, this is, this is one of the strangest things that's ever happened to me because yeah. it's like, you know, if someone taps your kneecap, you get kind of a reflex knee jerk and and you're aware of it, it's a little hard to control it. Right. But it's like my whole body was doing that. Mm. And, you know, up to and including like screaming no at candy for no good reason. And, and I remember thinking, this is so strange. And there's no reason why I should be doing this. And yet my body's doing this. Right. And, and, you know, I had understood theologically that, you know, but, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation, old things are passed away, all things are become new. And so yep. how can a Christian have a demon? And then I thought, I remember thinking, I'm good. I think I'm going to have to revise my theology. About <laughs> <this."> <laughs> right. Which, yeah, I mean, but that that's the level of of strangeness of this whole experience. That yeah. I was in the middle of just like screaming and like not being able to control it. But at the same time, I felt strangely calm and I had all my faculties yeah. and I and I was thinking, well, I think, you know, this theology that a Christian can't have a demon is probably not fitting my experience. <laughs> I, might, so, I might need to reconsider it. Yeah. 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 But but to be to be thinking that while all this is going on, totally just a bit. 
because I mean, I still have all my faculties, right? And I'm yeah. thinking, well, you know, as a neuroscientist, you know, should I should I be explaining this as I'm distressed because I, you know, have this diagnosis, or right. you know, is this a somehow temporal lobe epilepsy that's causing me to have these experiences? And so I have all these, you know, skeptical thoughts of like, well, you know, what? Uh, it, and I think, you know, I mean, my job is to critically analyze things, right. right? So, and I think that's a good thing. But I also know what I was experiencing, and <laughs> that was. That was uh, that was also very compelling. So yeah, this is beyond your sort of capabilities to rationalize. I mean, and and even though you're trying, you're like thinking through it at the same time. You're it, that that is a lot going on at the same time. I can't imagine. Uh, and then these yeah. poor pastors are like making <laughs> yeah. stuff up, and that's not it's not helping. You yeah. know, there, well, I think, there's a lot know, of moving they, parts. They genuinely wanted to help, and I appreciate sure. that. It's just they had no framework for yep. it. So one of them afterwards said, I didn't know what to do, but I was holding your feet down for you while you were shaking around on the floor. And I said, <laughs> well, okay, thanks. You know? thank, thank you. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. so at that point, we realized, uh, you know, I realized like, okay, I have some serious problems here. There's the brain tumor diagnosis, and now there seems to be demons involved. So... So I said, okay, now, uh, who do we talk to? And and there was a closet charismatic guy at our church who was like, <laughs> hey, there's a charismatic prayer group across town. They could probably help you with that. <laughs> so, so I said, all right, I'm there, you know? So I just walked in and they're like, oh yeah, we heard about you. We heard you had a demon, you know, we can take care of that. And I thought, is this going to hurt? <laughs> you know? Totally. I, but at that point, I didn't care. I said, you know what? You can smack me in the forehead, push me over. I really don't care. You know? I, I just, I need, I'm desperate. I need, Do yeah, something. I'm desperate. So I sat down and and this group started, you know, they started praying. And they're like, all right, if there's a spirit name, this thing, you know, come out of him in Jesus' name. And I would sit there like, I don't really feel anything going on. And and then they'd say, okay, this other kind of spirit in Jesus' name, leave him. And then all of a sudden I started shaking and screaming mm. and I broke my glasses and vomited. And even though I wasn't sick and anyway, this went on for like three hours. And at mm. the end of that, I I was, I started laughing and they're like, what demon is laughing? And I said, well, I just, I don't know. I feel so peaceful. And they said, oh, okay, yeah. I guess we're done. So, mm. so that was that was the introduction to deliverance ministry. And, <laughs> uh, just, and, just, it, it just happens to you. Yeah. Here we yeah, go. And then I, you know, there was a healing rooms nearby. And so I was like, well, healing rooms, you know, who are you people? You know, are you, are you Christians? Like, what is this? And they said, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so I, you know, after I'd sort of given them a little theological quick quiz, I'm like, okay, I guess you're all right. So, we can, <laughs> so, and they, so they started praying for me and the same thing happened. And, wow. and then they said, in fact, one of, one of them was, you know, one was praying for me, the others to the side of me. And, and she just kept saying, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. And my head whipped around and screamed at her. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and and uh, meanwhile, they said, well, there's a guy coming to town. His name's Pablo Batari. And he knows something about deliverance. And you should go to a seminar. And we're like, okay, well, I don't know who the guy is, but sure. So we showed up and and he taught for like a whole weekend about deliverance ministry. Mm. And, and by the end of the weekend, we're like, oh, that all makes so much more sense. Wow. Now. And, you know, Pablo Batari was the, I think Randy Clark gets a lot of his material from Pablo. And, and so Pablo's got his 10 step model for how to minister deliverance. And, you know, that's what Randy teaches. And that's, that's how we ended up learning how to minister deliverance. And, you know, fast mm. forward, I mean, I, I ministered deliverance to, I don't know, I can't count all the people. And, you know, I've traveled all over the world with Randy and uh, Randy Clark and, I've seen all kinds. Anyway, that that gets ahead of the story. But, uh, <laughs> but you're in this so, seminar, and it's like, wait a minute, this adds up, and yeah, this is what I need or am experiencing. Yeah. Well, I mean, that. actually, a lot of it was like crying for all the people who we wish we had known this when they were coming to us so mm. desperate. And if only we had been had this training, then we yeah. actually could have done more than take someone to the dry out place when he was like struggling yeah. with addictions yeah. or their voice was changing or whatever. And so, yeah. I mean, it's like there's the stuff going on with us, but then we are also thinking about like the bigger implications of totally. all of this. Totally. Wow. So meanwhile, 
back in the the, the medical land, um, yeah, I kept getting tests done. They were doing MRIs on me every three months, and and once I saw that, I saw this deliverance happening, and you know, I it, it seemed to me that I had a, at least as much of a spiritual problem as a medical one. Hmm. Uh, so I kept getting, I got a whole lot of prayer ministry, and at a certain point, I decided, okay, if the demons are real, then Jesus got to be real too, <laughs> and mm. you know, maybe he still heals people. So uh, we basically, I, I basically decided I'm gonna, I'm gonna put everything, uh, you know, all my chips on the table. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get prayed for. I'm gonna, uh, I need a miracle. There is no plan B right. other than to die. So I'm gonna put everything into looking for a miracle, and so. I travel in the next year, I travel like 50,000 miles. I went all over. I went to, we drove to every big name healing minister you can think of. <laughs> I bet all you did. Them. Yeah. And, and, you know, I got prayed for and I did, it felt like grabbing an electrical wire and I'd end up on the floor and then I'd get mm. back up and get prayed for again. And Well, and we year, did this obnoxiously. Like there would be a speaker who was exhausted from <laughs> like doing lots and lots of meetings, <laughs> assistant promises to pray for Josh, speaker like sneaks out to his hotel room. Right. We find out where his hotel is. We totally. go there, we call from the lobby and bring him out of his bedroom in his pajamas to come it. pray for Josh. I love Does it. Does graciously. It's powerful. I mean, we had no etiquette in this yeah. because well, you're we were desperate totally yeah. whatever it takes so so this went on you know we visit all these places and then three months later i had another mri and i i said okay let's see what god did you know i right. felt the power of god let's see so so we get the mri results and we had a camera rolling we were ready to capture mm. the moment when it was all clear and so i pulled the results out and read it and it said tumors as bad as ever you know, you're mm. still in a heap of trouble. So wow. at that point, I I thought, okay, well, you know, do I do I give up and get ready to die, or do I do I keep on going? And I decided that I was either going to get healed or die trying. And so, yeah. so I ended up, you know, I traveled traveled a uh, ended up traveling on trips with Randy Clark, and and I remember the first one I went to. This was in Cuba, and it was the very first day we were in Havana, and there's uh, so there's about, I don't know, 15, 20 of us in this group, and one of them, uh, you know, we're, we're in this little storefront church in Havana, and one of them says, oh, look, there's a blind guy on the sidewalk. Let's go. Let's go see if he wants to get prayed for. And I thought, okay, this sounds kind of obnoxious, but, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll watch. And, and so they go out and accost this guy on the sidewalk, and he's walking <laughs> along with a cane, and and within about 15 minutes, he's reading the license plates off these old 1950s cars they have. Wow. In and, and I watched this like, wait, what just happened? The, the, this guy was, and so uh, anyway, so they, they kept praying with him. And, and by the end of that week, uh, you know, we were in, we were in Southern Cuba and, and the guy who was leading the trip had to go, he had some some family emergency. And so it was just the, the team members and we found some random church and walked in there. And And by the end of the night, I, a, a new friend and I had been praying for this woman. And she said, well, I haven't been able to see more than a few feet in front of me for, for several years. And so we, we prayed for her, nothing's happening. We start, we said, well, you know, what was going on when you lost your eyesight? And she said, oh, I had this really traumatic thing happen. So we prayed for inner healing. Hmm. She's crying. Then we pray for her eyesight. She's totally instantly healed. Wow. See clearly all the way across the building. And, and that just, that was like a, a turning point because if you see someone who, you know, is, is blind right in front of you, has been for a long time and they just start seeing that has an effect on you. Yeah. And, so, you know, a, a few months later, I went to Brazil with Randy and we we're in a stadium and and uh, I was praying for people for healing. And there's a couple blind kids uh, in the in the healing line. Friend and I prayed for them. They each got their eyesight back within a few minutes. And you, you could see because their eyes were white. <laughs> and, you know, so it wasn't just like, oh, you know, what do you need prayer for? You just look at them. You're like, well, your, your eyes are white. You're obviously blind. Yeah. So. And they're like, yep, they're blind, you know, can't see a hand in front of the face. And 
So we pray and, and both of them get their eyesight back. And wow. And this is so I'm in this weird position where I'm I'm going to work and I'm doing all this scientific research and I'm doing brain imaging experiments. And my research by that point is was getting pretty good traction. I mean, I was in the news all over the world for some of the re, the brain research I was doing. And yet, ironically, here I am and I still have this brain tumor and I'm watching miracles happen. And it's like, this, I, I don't I'm like, this can't be normal. Yeah, how do I square all of these things? So I'm seeing healing, but I'm not getting healed. I'm a neurologist. I'm doing all of this work. I mean, this is like, that's a lot of things at the same time. But yet you're still going after it. You're going, I'm going to go and do this. Brazil, Cuba. I mean. I was convinced that at that point I was seeing something real. hmm. And, And I didn't fully understand it. But I knew that there was some, I didn't see how this could be people making stuff up. Yeah. And, and, you know, and it's part of my job to ask all the hard questions like, okay, how could you possibly explain this? And, and it just, you know, so I know what I saw. And so I kept getting more MRIs done on my head another three months. And they said, well, it still looks bad, but it's not growing. And then three months later, well, it almost looks a little smaller. We're not, not sure what to make of it, you know. And then by by the one year mark, the the readings came back. And so it looks like, you know, some, I don't know, maybe it just grew a little funny, you know. And, the, and they stopped talking about a tumor. And, and but you have to understand in the beginning, I said, okay, is there any way this could be something besides a tumor? And they right. said, well, there's a, we had the head of radiology saying, well, you know, there's a small chance it could be a focal infection, but, you know, you're... You're, you know, you've never had a seizure before in your life. Now you're having multiple seizures. We see this on the MRI. There's no doubt as to what's going on here. That's, and you know, if it's an infection, it'll resolve within a few months. And well, it didn't. And so they said, well, it's pretty clear it's a tumor. And so I, and I never did have a, a, a biopsy because they said, you know, we could do a biopsy, but there's a chance the biopsy would kill you. And it also wouldn't help us treat it any differently. You know, you'd right. still die of it anyway. So I said, well, okay, I think I'll pass. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so after after a year, it, you know, and, and the last MRI I had was now, it was seven years after the diagnosis. And it just said, well, it looks like some scar tissue. And Go on. that was that was almost 20 years ago. Wow. Uh, since all that happened. And I've been totally fine ever since. I never did have surgery or chemo or radiation. Again, not because I was opposed to it, but because it wouldn't have done any good. Right. So, but I've been totally fine. And in the meantime, you know, that that whole thing just totally changed our life trajectories. I mean, we still have our careers, but, but after I saw it, and I've seen more blind people get their eyesight back than I can count. Like I literally can't even count them all. And so that all, all of that had such a profound effect on both of us. Yeah. And, and, and but it was a process. And it wasn't, I mean, I think Jay, a while ago, you said, oh, it's something that's done to you. Uh, there was definitely a role of us being very actively uh, yeah. involved in this over quite a period of time. So there was a lot of time just praying, Josh, especially like, reading like theology, studying the scriptures, fasting, praying, yeah. worshiping. The deliverance part of this was about a five month process. And, mm. uh, and, and like me, like a number of these multi hour, uh, sometimes prayer sessions kind of mm. getting different layers of it. And so like one piece of it was like, well, we probably shouldn't have been like taking on high level principalities in our little prayer group when we yeah. had no basis for doing that. Oh, Freemasons in the family, like that's actually a problem because it's yeah. like idolatry and curses that you're kind of invoking uh, on the generations. When I was pregnant, our baby was breech and mm. we were trying to like get her to flip. And some of the stuff we did was just silly, like putting like frozen vegetables on my stomach in a bathtub or like you got a flashlight on one end, classical music on the other. But some of it was like seeking spiritual help from mm. uh, sources other than the Holy Spirit. 
it. Mm. And so when we first met with Pablo Batari, who had been the head of uh, director of deliverance ministry for the revivalist Carlos Anacondi in Argentina for, for many years and is like one of the most experienced ministers in this. Well, he prayed for Josh uh, kind of personally, and he just asked, well, Holy Spirit, what's going on here? And one of the things that came up mm. was that trying to get this breech baby to turn, uh, we tried what's called moxibustion, which is you take this stinky mugwort herb, you roll it into cigars, and you burn it on your baby toes. And somehow that's supposed to cause the baby to flip, mm. which mm. in retrospect is the most ridiculous thing in the world. Like, right. what, what were we even thinking in doing that? And what we were thinking was, well, there's a peer-reviewed medical journal article in the Journal of the American Medical Association that says it works. Yeah. And that's often the question that even Christians ask about alternative medicine. Hmm. Does it work without stopping to think, well, why is it supposed to work? Yeah. And what spiritual source are we calling on instead of the Holy Spirit? Yeah. And this is what Pablo said is like, oh, I see so much demonization in the United States. Hmm. And it's often the alternative medicine. And you are invoking the spiritual energy of the sun, kind of drying this herb. And that's a problem and you need to repent of this. And wow. likewise, we kept, kept taking trips off to the chiropractor who was somehow going to persuade the baby to turn with this wow. special technique that, that she had and my insurance didn't want to touch. And we're like, oh, well, we're still going to drive an hour each way to do this uh, multiple right. times because somehow we were so desperate thinking yeah. about like, how do we avoid a C-section, which we didn't actually manage. I still had a C-section. <laughs> um, but we also got super oppressed along right. the way. Wow. And, and I mean, this is kind of partly like what kind of made us realize the, the, the magnitude of all of this was even in that very first time when Josh started manifesting, I just remember sensing there is a, there is a presence of evil that is so palpable mm. in this room. Something hates the name of Jesus. Yeah. Jesus has to be real. And so we just had prayer session after prayer session. And sometimes it was quick and he would just like fall over and something would kind of be released. Sometimes yeah. it was much more kind of thorough. The final showdown, and we do actually know exactly, we don't know when it was healed, but we do know exactly when he got the final deliverance. Yeah. And we were back at the same charismatic prayer group where they had um, kind of begun kind of loving us five months before. And Josh was leading worship and he all of a sudden just kind of slumped down not in a good way. Hmm. And uh, something was kind of stirred up and disturbed. And the leader of that prayer group remembered the name from my dream. Wow. Uh, and we we haven't told very many people this name because we just don't really want to give it more attention. Sure. Like it, it yeah. doesn't need the, it doesn't need the press, but he knew it. Uh, he called it out. He went after it directly and it, 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 it left. Uh, wow. Josh like runs to the bathroom, kind of like not sick, but needing to kind of run and kind of vomit. Uh, the entire building smelled like sulfur wow. in, in a way that's not like a human explanation. Like right. it was just, there was something like just very kind of like exposed mm. uh, in, in what took place. And that was it. That was the end of it. The there end. were no more demonic manifestations. And every time people would pray for Josh after that, it would often be powerful. Mm. Like it, it would look like he was uh, hanging onto an electrical wire or he'd be laughing or he'd be shaking or people would start getting healed. Uh, but it was all kind of the good kind of stuff, right. uh, not not the bad stuff that, right. that had been so much of a part of our lives for the, the previous month. Wow. What an incredible story. I mean, I have like literally five million questions that <laughs> no, no less than five million. But but it sounds like then and this is the way these things tend to work. You you know, you minister out of the healing you've received. Right. So now yeah. both of your faith to minister to people has got to be through the roof. You're like, hey, we know this is real. We know the kinds of experiences we've had. Not just when you're traveling, I imagine, but... Yeah. Oh, no. I mean, at home, like there was, right. we had family members who kind of realized that Jesus is real and we need to kind of get rid of the stuff that we were into before uh, mm. when they watched like a tumor disappear 
in front of their eyes. Now that doesn't mean people don't kind of like, that doesn't mean everyone gets healed. And right. we have had people die on our watch and right. it's, it's heartbreaking. Like people that we prayed for, for hours over and over and over again. Yeah. And they literally die within hours of, yeah. of when we're praying for them. And I, I don't have an explanation for it. I do know that I'm not satisfied with kind of some kind of simplistic, like, oh, you must not have had enough faith or enough holiness. Right. That just doesn't account for the many people we've seen healed who don't seem to have any faith and they don't yeah. seem to have a whole lot of holiness either. And, and the, the, the dear kind of devoted Christians who, who have, who have died. And, right. and I mean, I think of this as, as a battle. And I mean, I think this is where kind of the, the original version of kind of John Wimber, like it's mm -hmm. all the kingdom's already and not yet. And that yeah. means I'm not going to try and explain why it's not yet. Yeah. I'm going to press in and kind of recognize this is a battle. There's not just a blueprint that whatever mm -hmm. happens must be God's will. And if someone totally. dies, that must somehow in God's sovereignty be it all works together for good. I mean, that's, that's not, that does not uh, kind of fit with with experience and i don't even think that's that's biblical or yeah. it, or or it even honors god mm. there is a real battle between a real kingdom of heaven and a real kingdom of darkness and we don't win all of those battles even though ultimately christ is the victor he has won that mm. uh, but there's still that enemy and and we're gonna fight even though it, it's it's heartbreaking when mm. when we don't get the breakthroughs Man. But we see a lot of breakthroughs, too. For the six weeks leading up to Pentecost Sunday with a break for Mother's Day, we're sharing stories that highlight the movement of the Holy Spirit among us. This is part of the Empowered series that vineyards all over the U.S. are participating in. For more information on this series, check out vineyardusa.org slash Pentecost 2023 and share your stories on social media using the hashtag VUSAEmpowered. We can't wait to see what the Holy Spirit does during this time. Registration is now open for our 2023 National Conference, Making All Things New. This year's focus is on evangelism, church planning, and global missions, and we're gathering in the beautiful Black Mountain, North Carolina, right outside of Asheville. There's special programming for kids and youth, so bring the whole family. Early bird pricing is available until May 31st, so register today. Link is in the show notes. You had mentioned earlier, once you're experiencing all this, you think back and you go, man, if we had just had some more tools. We could have been more helpful to more people or if we had had different kinds of experiences. So there's any number of folks I'm sure listening to us that would go, man, I, I believe in what you're saying. I don't know what to do. I would probably be like those pastors who just sing a song and hold your feet down. Like, so, so for you, when you've just sort of like tr seen people trained or you've experienced training yourself, you you've you mentioned a couple different places, but what what would you recommend if people are starting into this? Maybe even in their own life, they're going, man. The, the more you're talking, I, I discover that when we talk about these things, my experience in, in the life of our churches, people will begin to even realize. I think there's something like this going on with me. I have something oppressive happening that's beyond just sort of I'm tired or I'm hungry or. You know, like there's something else yeah. it, happening. And then there, and at first, the first reaction then is there maybe a bit of fear. Oh, no, like, I, you know, I'm, they imagine something from The Exorcist or whatever, some, some crazy film they probably weren't supposed to see they saw. Yeah. But then once they sort of get through that, they're like, okay, so what are my steps? Or as a pastor, a leader... I've noticed something with this person in my small group or what are you sort of your basic recommendations? Like, well, how do you think people take yeah. next steps? Well, I mean, so first of all, Josh's story is is dramatic. The mm -hmm. vast majority of ministry situations that we've been in are very calm, yeah. very gentle. Yep. Uh, I don't actually think for the most part that you have to tell things to manifest. We actually right. follow Pablo Batari's model that you tell things not to manifest. Yes. Um, 
the vast majority of times there's no screaming, there's no, there's no barfing. You just close the doors that let things in and yeah. they very quietly leave. But you do need to tell them to leave. They don't just go on their own mm. for the most part. So, I mean, in terms of resources, I think we still recommend more than anything on deliverance, Pablo Batari's Free in Christ is the English mm. translation. Mm. Uh, and one of the best kind of theology books on this is one of the ones that Josh started with back from the 1920s, and it's F.F. F. Bosworth's Christ the Healer. Hmm. Uh, and those two pieces can actually get you some distance. That's so good. That's so good. And then, Josh, when you think back on your life up to these awarenesses, can you see like, man, there was demonic stuff pushing me around way before I became aware of it, or did it really all just become conscious as, you know, it was conscious? Or can you think back and go, man, there was stuff niggling around for a while that I probably didn't recognize what was going on? Or did it all sort of just appear? That's an interesting question. I wouldn't say there was anything dramatic. I mean, right. you know, since since I got all that freedom, I, I mean, I prayed for all kinds of people, hundreds and hundreds of people, ministered mm -hmm. deliverance. And I've seen, you know, most of them, like Candy said, are pretty, it's just calm, yep. focus on loving the person. Occasionally, I'd say one out of a hundred times, it gets dramatic and, you know, it's vomiting and that sort of thing. We try to minimize that. But yep. so I've seen people who have been really, really oppressed, tormented, just suffering horribly. And, yeah. and, I, and I know something of what that is, which is why I hate it so much. And I want to see people get free. Yeah, man. But, but to answer your question, I don't know that I had a, a whole lot of obvious things like... Mm -hmm. You know, I would say, oh, that's obviously a demonic or something. Yeah. I think probably there were a lot of ways in which, uh, I mean, I had to have various uh, physical pains and ailments and, and and you know, a certain amount of emotional pain. But the thing is, I tend to be kind of a more cerebral person. <laughs> right, so exactly. I'm not so much like, like, I, I know what I'm feeling, but that that doesn't necessarily drive my behavior. So, right, right. So I, I and I would just say he never see like I never would have thought, oh, my husband is demonized. I would have married him <laughs> right. if I had. But afterwards, <laughs> right. right after he got the deliverance, like the level of anointing and authority yeah. just yeah. like went like way up. It's yeah. it's kind of like you just and and I mean we've had this like people we've ministered to like you they they're set free and they're like my head's so quiet. Like yeah. I had no idea that there was all this like constant, like chatter that wasn't me in my yep. head, like bringing yep. me down. But you only realize afterwards, like how you're being limited before. And and that would be my kind of take. That's and I mean, good. I got deliverance and freedom along the way too. And sure. I mean, I think, so it's like, it, it may not be obvious, but right. there's still maybe a higher level of freedom that's available. That's really right. good. And and I think the way you're saying that is helpful for people because there can be a familiarity to these things that then once you experience freedom, you're like, oh, I've, I thought that was just my own mind or my own busyness or my own anxiety yeah. or I thought I just had kind of self-condemning thoughts all the time. But what you begin to realize is, no, that's something dark that's messing with you. And once well, and it gets cleared be, out. Yeah. And I mean, this shouldn't be a matter of like guilt or shame that no. there's something kind of uniquely wrong with you if Precisely. you need deliverance. I mean, this should be the children's bread, yes. just like healing is also deliverance. And I mean, this is where yes. like someone like Batari would say that like probably most people in the church uh, would benefit from deliverance. And, no doubt. and this is just standard practice when yes. they've got revivalistic meetings in yes. a lot of Latin America, everyone goes through it. Yes. And that's also why they've got like 90% retention rates for their revivals compared to maybe 6% in, in the U.S. if someone like goes forward for, a, for an altar call, because you kind of do that deep work. This Amen. should be just that in, in, in kind of my conclusion from all of this is that rather than deliverance being the last resort, the way yeah. that it often is presented by by Christian leaders, I really think it should be the first resort. Like Amen. this is just like early church. You you 
did exorcisms before someone was even baptized. That's and right. when they were baptized, they would start kind of having kind of outpourings and gifts of the Holy Spirit because yes. you're you're doing this work. And it's and and often it's pastors and leaders who yes. are under the most attack and who are being oppressed and who need freedom. And so no one should feel embarrassed or ashamed, like no matter what level you are in leadership in a church, even or a denomination, yes. this this should be just a part of how we love one another in as, as part of the body of Christ. Amen. And, and you know, that is definitely my experience, too. Like, I could tell a long story, but when I first started to work at a Vineyard Church, I was in the middle of a meeting where I had, it's interesting the way you described it, like I had too much caffeine, like there was an anxiety and a pressure and my mind was racing. And and I could tell it was connected to what the pastor was teaching about, but I couldn't tell what was going I felt literally like something's not right. And I grabbed him on the way out and said, something's not right. I don't know what's not right. But something's not right. Something you're talking about is really agitating me. He said, oh, that could be some kind of demonic thing. Let me just pray for you. And we're like literally walking outside. He puts his hand on me and I drop to my knees and like puke in this bush. <laughs> and I was like, what in the world just happened? Now, I'd had some experiences of the Holy Spirit. I'd had encounters with God. I'd never anything like that. And so I'm going in to work the next, I must have been two days later. And I'm thinking, I, th I wonder if I'm going to get fired. Like, are you allowed to, to have these things happen and work <laughs> in the church? I mean, I, I, you know, I didn't know. Yeah. And I remember coming in and he's like, OK, well, let's get to work. Here's the things we want to do for research. And I said, hey, hold on. Can we pause a minute? We got to talk about what just happened the other day. He said, oh, sure. What do you want to talk about? I said, what do you mean what do I want to talk about? Well, you were there. You pray. I'm, I dropped my knees, the whole thing. He goes, oh, well, that's normal. That's that's the stuff we do. You know, like if you're in the middle of trying to pursue a life with God in a broken world, this there's stuff that from your own family story, from decisions you made in ignorance, and or just kind of being around a lot of mess, stuff tries to stick to you. This is just the way it works. And I, it was so helpful because then he's like, anyway, I don't think we have to talk about it anymore. Let's move on. And it... It really helped me. And I don't think he was being coy. I think he was actually going, no, this is kind of what we do. And I'm amazed. And I've told that story. I don't even know how many times. And the amount of times pastors then kind of sheepishly go, man, could you pray with me? I, I've, I have some things that just seem to hang around and hang around. It's like, of course. Yeah, let's, let's pray together. And the amount of freedom people can experience. Again, not in just the massively dramatic ways, but... And more subtle, gentle, almost like um, like taking a shower. Sometimes, like it's like, yeah, stuff just gets washed off of you. You're you're getting freed up, and this shifts all kinds of things. Like when you think about spiritual disciplines, or having a prayer life, or being in community, or the power of confession. Now those things aren't just sort of like moral balancing scale kind of things. They're m ways we're interacting with the Holy Spirit. And we're saying no to dark things that want to hook us or mess with us. The, you know, don't give the devil a foothold. That's an interesting verse. You know, it's written to believers. Exactly. <laughs> and that's something about holding on to anger can give the enemy space, like a foothold within the life of the church or a believer. Huh. That's an interesting verse. And so, so when we're doing confession, when we're praying for one another, when we're doing forms of warfare, and to your point, the early church was not confused about this. I mean, when we go baptize somebody, they're like, we're assuming you probably have some stuff that needs to get cleaned off of you if we're going to baptize you. That's just the assumption, which, man, I, I don't know. It's kind of the operating assumption I have. At this point, as I'm helping lead people to Jesus and into life with Christ, and then in the, specifically in early discipleship, but to your point, also with leaders, they end up in a with a different level of assignment against them that it's wise for them to pay attention to. I, I couldn't agree more. Huh. 
Well, and if we don't, I mean, so many kind of high profile scandals in church leadership, I I don't think we would see so many of them if Mm. we really had deliverance as a regular part of of what we do in the church. And we also wouldn't see such strange ways of doing deliverance, which give a bad name to the whole thing. Because if it's, if it's a backroom ministry or you've got to kind of go look for the high profile person, it Mm. doesn't have the kind of accountability that you have when this is a regular part of the, of the local congregation with oversight and people involved in it. And, and, and it's not kind of in the shadows. That's so good. And Josh, you were going to add something. Yeah, I mean, I think the, essentially what we're talking about is demystifying deliverance. And I think yeah. that's a really key point because a lot of the popular conception of deliverance is, you know, the exorcist, people's heads doing 360s and barfing pea soup. And <laughs> and so if you say deliverance, it, it, it conjures up all these associations that I think are ultimately not helpful because it, it creates the sense that you either avoid the topic entirely and just suffer on in silence yeah or you have to go through this dramatic and humiliating experience of you know having the you know a dozen people shouting at you while you like behave in a very undignified way and yeah and i think the the there's a an unnecessary fear of the whole process and mm. i think what i've seen is that this does not need to be a dramatic thing. I mean, my case yeah. was very unusual and I've, I totally. mean, I've probably ministered deliverance, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of people. And and the vast majority, it's just like you say, you're taking a spiritual shower and there's yeah. no shame in getting dirt on you. You know, the shame is if you let it stay on you. Yes, right? that's right. So, you know, we when we pray with people, it's gentle, it's focused on the person, it's how do we love this person and help them get free, and not how do we have a big demon circus. I mean, yes. who needs that, right? <laughs> this isn't about them, it's about the person who needs to get free. And so yes. if stuff starts to get out of hand, I'll just tell it in Jesus' name, stop it. Yeah, <laughs> You know, we're, we're not having this. Yes. All, all we're going to have is you're going to leave quietly and this person's going to be free. Yes. And, and so, and I think I wish that within the, the, you know, North American church more broadly, that this were normalized. It doesn't need Amen. to be a scary thing. It doesn't need to be a, you know, now I think we, we do need some kind of like, we need more teaching about it for one. Yep. And and we need it to be normalized and with support structures, because every once in a while you can get in kind of deep, <laughs> you know, things start getting out of hand. You want to have somebody you can call on if you're in totally. a pickle. But otherwise, I, there's no reason why this can't be as normal as, you know, sort of praying for healing or hmm. uh, or just having a, a Bible study group. You know, you meet, you talk about stuff, you pray and and if there's some, and I think part of the issue is that we haven't distinguished clearly between between possession and oppression. Yes. And, you know, the Greek word, this was really helpful for me when I was in the middle of it. The Greek word for demonized is daimonitsumai, which just means it, it spans the whole range from full possession to just being oppressed and tormented. And, yep. and I think so you, people have this false dichotomy that, oh, you know, I can't, you know, th- this doesn't apply to me unless I'm fully possessed. Right. And, and I think that's just not helpful because there's a whole category of you're oppressed, but you're not possessed. Yes. And, and what you need is to get free of that oppression. Yes. And 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 it's a false dichotomy to say that, well, you, you can't get ministry unless you're fully possessed. I think that's just really unhelpful. Yes. Yes. That's really helpful language. And. And there is good teaching, to your point, that we have to lean into as pastors and leaders and those who minister, because to your point, the cartoon images freak people out. But then the, yeah. the other thing is also not helpful, which is, oh, that's not a real thing and whatever, also unhelpful. So it's yeah. it's really trying to occupy that space where we're normalizing, demystifying helping people realize these things are on a scale. I mean, so much of the New Testament 
is warning us about these things. It's written to Christians, you know, this yep. isn't uh, those out there. It's to, to believers, people following Jesus, like, hey, keep an eye on some of these things. It's all through the New Testament. And to your point, the international church, this isn't even a conversation. You know, like if you're pretty much anywhere outside the West, yeah. I, I remember we were teaching this village in the middle of nowhere in Ethiopia. And it's, you know, they kind of do the classic, big evangelistic crusade thing. So it's packed with people. We're preaching. And this woman just comes running out of the village and she's screaming, foreigner, I'm going to kill you in their native language. And this guy just, two guys grab her and they kind of take her off to the side and she's screaming. And I look at the guy sitting next to me. I go, is that okay? He goes, oh, she's just demonized. It'll be fine. (laughs) And like 20 minutes later, she's sitting in the group, just like listening and teaching and and nobody really bats an eye. It's like, you know, these are just things that happen and, you know, we we deal yeah. with it. And I had the same experience <laughs> in Brazil. You know, right. at, at one point we're in about we're in an uh, indoor stadium, of about 5000 people. Randy mm. Clark's like, OK, I'm just going to take authority over every demon in this whole stadium. And, <laughs> and I thought, oh. Uh, I don't think that's a good idea. Can you do that? Yeah, right, right. Well, he did. <laughs> yeah. And I th- and and as soon as he did, I looked around and I saw a whole bunch of people fall over on the ground and start shaking and writhing. Yep. And, yep. and then Randy was like, oh, well, you know, if you feel something weird going on, why don't you come around behind stage and somebody will pray with you? And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> so I, I ran back behind the stage and there's a line of like literally 100 people. Yeah. And they're all shaking and screaming and and I and there was like one or two teams of people, who, you know, in a line of a hundred. <laughs> yeah, we're all so started, in. Here we go. Right. I started pulling people out of line, and I remember this one moment. I was like, okay, so you know, I'm, I'm talking to someone like, how do you, you know? Uh, so how might this thing have gotten in? And and you know, okay, well, you renounce it, and I'll command it to leave. And and while this is going on, there's another woman curled up at my feet in a fetal position screaming her head off and so mm, i was yeah. like okay in jesus name be quiet i'll deal with yeah. you next yeah <laughs> you know not to the woman but to right and and so this was just like you know a normal service and i said totally so i thought well this you know that's just a normal part of the church life. Yeah. So. Can we organize that a little differently next time, please? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, the ministry is good, but you right. want to make sure you're prepared for it. Totally. So. Well, and, and that's it. And so I, I, you know, there's another, there's a guy named Steve Nicholson, who you probably know that did a talk recently for us on how leaders are encountering the demonic all the time and often not realizing it. Voices of accusation in their mind or just different kinds of um discouragement that really is like paper cuts you know that it, it doesn't kill you but it just knocks you around and if you if you have enough paper cuts over a week or a month or a year you really are sort of just beat up you're just beat up and you need people to minister to you and minister healing and freedom from especially in any ways you've agreed with this stuff if it's coming at yeah. you um, turning that loose putting that in front of Jesus so that you can be Set free to do all the things God has asked you to do. And we're not hunting for this stuff. It shows up just yeah. fine without us hunting. <laughs> they, 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 you know, so yeah. We're just doing other stuff. And then these things sort of step in the, in the way. And that's what you see in Jesus. He's not out there hunting around. They, they show themselves as he's doing ministry and yeah. bringing life to people. So. Yeah. Well, and and I think part of it is if we're trying to just do it all on our own strength, we don't have enough. And I think this can be kind of part of the mindset of, well, that deliverance stuff, like maybe it's needed as a last resort. You really just should have like more willpower and just like try harder not to sin. But the problem is that like we, yes, we have a sin nature, but it can get supercharged by things that are more powerful than, uh, than we are. And it's not helpful to just tell people to try harder when they need some help um, being set free. Uh, Now, that's not to say there isn't kind of stuff for us to do. And I mean, I think the kind of the starting point is is often forgiveness. And I mean, that's. I mean, that's something we've we've had to to do some of ourselves recently, like people legitimately like 
can wrong you. And sometimes it's a matter of, I choose to forgive like every single day until you can actually kind of like feel the freedom of doing it. But that's probably one of the number one openings is, uh, is, is really kind of walking in forgiveness. Yes. Yeah. What you bind on earth is bound in heaven. When you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. That it's in that little weird section with forgiveness. Yeah. And then there's the little demonic components that fall yeah. from that. So, yeah, those Jesus again, this stuff, Jesus is teaching it pretty clearly. The early church led the way through most of the worldwide church. This is really normative. We're just in this weird little swath. And what I love about you guys is you're brilliant people. You, you're you serious academics. Like, you know, too often a conversation like this feels like it's relegated for someone who's an anti-intellectual. And it's easy to go, ah, well, that's just what the weirdos do. Um, but not only is it your story, it's your practice, it's the life that you live into, and you're, ser- and you're looking at brain scans. And, you know, you're realizing all the things are working together together. And it's why I'm so grateful for you both and your courage to tell your story, to lead and minister the way you do. I know this is going to help so many people. I'm just really, really grateful. Thank you for making time. Yeah, well, thanks for yeah. having us. And I think it's, it's yeah. it feels like, uh, you know, what we went through was pretty horrible. Yeah. And, but if it, you know, I mean, we came out the other end. You know, praise the Lord. And if that can be a help to some people, then, you know, that, that's a good thing. Well, I'm yeah. sure of it. And I know it's helping me. I feel like even in this call, I want to get up and go spend some time walking around in prayer. <laughs> because it does. I feel I feel stirred yeah. up like, Lord, we need we need more of your spirit. We need more faith to step into these things because there's a lot of people that need a lot of help all around us, not least of which are us. So God have mercy on us. But thank you. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Well, maybe next time we'll talk about... uh, More research. Documenting miracles. I would like that. You want to do some... Okay, see, I've I've hooked you in. I've got you for a third. You you signed up. Everyone heard it. (laughs) You're in for a third one. Because you are doing incredible work that's documenting all these things. And we'll make sure we link that in again because, man, uh, yeah, and it flows neatly from your story. So, okay, yeah. we'll do it again. We'll do another one. Okay, that sounds good. Sounds great. And yeah. uh, we'll have a, we got a few more uh, miracle case reports coming out. So, Amen. And, uh, and hopefully a TV series we started filming. Ooh. Out, so. So that should uh, probably still be at least a year or two out, but, oh. but we have we have started filming. So oh, I can't wait! I can't uh, wait. Cool. Yeah, I think the and especially with people trying to attack us over the case reports, that's gonna. I mean, I, I'm I'm not gonna name names, but no. I think that'll add to the. You know, it, it tells a bit more of a story. Well, and anyone that's listening should be praying for you, praying that God protects. We certainly you. would welcome that. And the work yeah. that you're doing, because mm-hmm. obviously, as we talked about, if there's a real battle, the kind of work you're trying to do is going to get some pushback. So, yeah, we will. We commit to pray. The We Are Vineyard podcast is a production from the team at Vineyard USA. If you've been enjoying the podcast, here's a few ways you can help us. Leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice. This helps more people find us. Connect with us online for additional resources. Our website is vineyardusa.org. And we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at at VineyardUSA. Thanks for listening. See you next week.